We are the church that lives into God's future today, a church united across space and time, a church of many races, languages and ethnicities, a church that lives by the work of God in Christ that was, is now and is still to come. The The one who is seated on the throne says to us, See, I am making all things new, a new heaven and a new earth, where the home of God is among God's people. God's future is epic and it's it's good news. We remember God's future, for this is our story. Psalm 100 Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. 
come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Well, it's a year into um, social restrictions and lockdowns and what have you, and um, I have to say I've found it hard really not meeting up physically with people, with family, friends, with church family, and um, not being able to meet uh, for worship together in that way. But um, lots of little things that um, I miss, like little little things that give you sparks of joy, like um, you know, free and inconsequential chit chat and seeing how people really are in 3D and casual conversations that um, with people you don't really know very well, but sometimes lead to significant things. Um, and I miss hugs. I was just getting uh, used to them and getting over my inbred Britishness and um, learning to appreciate them. Um, but um, Worshipping together, I find, uh, strengthens my faith. Because just because I'm there with other people and enjoying them worshipping too and being encouraged by that. And singing together, obviously, that's the thing. Um, praying together, you can do that over Zoom uh, and that's okay. But you can't really sing together. Have you tried it? Uh, but anyway, I've got to say, where will we be without modern technology, without all this uh, Zoom and uh, other things like that that we can uh, enjoy and use to talk to each other? So um, to fill the gaps left by the Sunday morning, uh, we've got YouTube videos and that's been great. It's a huge amount of work for Peter to do all that. Um, but uh, that's been good and that's that's kept us all on the same page. Um, so that's fine. And then there's all these other interactions that we can have, like phone calls and texts, emails, WhatsApp, um, and Zoom and Skype and what have you. Uh, I have to, thinking about it, I don't think I use phone calls as much as I should, really. Uh, because when you phone somebody up, it kind of demands their instant attention. And it kind of feels like you're, you're intruding. Um, so I'm always a bit hesitant to phone people, really, when I haven't got a good excuse. Uh, emails are good. Um, I, I use them. Do you know what? In Swahili, an email is called a barua pepe. A barua is a letter, and upepo is wind. Uh, so I always remember the Swahili for an email is barua pepe, letter that goes like the wind. Uh, so we've got text, we've got WhatsApp. Zoom's all right, but it, you're a bit wooden with it, at least I am. Um, but anyway, it's better than nothing. And the growth groups have been using it, um, and that's fine. Uh, I know that for a lot of people who are at work, they're on Zoom or on the computer all day. They don't want to be on Zoom in the evening. So it doesn't fit everybody, this kind of thing. Um, but anyway... At least uh, in lockdown, people are more likely to be at home. So if we wander around, like Angela and I have occasionally wandered around and knocked on people's door to have a doorstep chat. And that's worked well, because uh, people are most likely to be in. So overall, I thank God for the modern communications technology, which actually allows us to be in touch, even though we can't physically meet up. But it's been hard. I'll be looking forward to when it when we're allowed to meet properly together. With the people he had collected on his journey, Abraham's community now numbered over 300 men before counting women and children. Plenty of men, but no son. 
Sarah had an idea. Why don't you have a son by my Egyptian maid, Hagar? He will be yours, that will be all right. Abraham agreed and it happened. Ishmael was born. But while God blessed Ishmael, he was not the one he wanted to use to fulfill his purpose. A further 13 years passed. One day, Abraham, now 99 years old, sitting in his tent, noticed three men nearby. He invited them to rest a while and to eat with him. Sarah prepared the meal. As they ate, one of the men told Abraham that in a year's time, he and Sarah would have a son. Sarah laughed at it, but the man responded, Is anything too hard for the Lord? As the three men got up to leave, they headed for Sodom. Fast forward the conversation between Abraham and the Lord and how the other two men rescued Lot and some of his family just before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. True to what the Lord had said, in a year's time, Isaac was born and grew up as a lad. At last, it seemed that God's plan could move forward. But at what cost? The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God had said it would, and Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God has commanded. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born, and Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All will hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. When Isaac grew up and was about to be weaned, Abraham prepared a huge feast to celebrate the occasion. But Sarah saw Ishmael, the son of Abraham and her Egyptian servant Hagar, making fun of their son Isaac. So she turned to Abraham and demanded, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. He is not going to share the inheritance with my son Isaac. I won't have it. This upset Abraham very much because Ishmael was his son. But God told Abraham, Do not be upset over the boy and your servant. Do whatever Sarah tells you, for Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. But I will also make a nation of the descendants of Hagar's son, because he is your son too. So Abraham got up early the next morning, prepared food and a container of water, and strapped them to Hagar's shoulders. Then he sent her away with her son, and she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water was gone, she put the boy in the shade of a bush. Then she went and sat down by herself about a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said, as she burst into tears. But God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven, Hagar, what's wrong? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation from his descendants. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled the water container and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness. He became a skillful archer and he settled in the wilderness of Paran. His mother arranged for him to marry a woman from the land of Egypt. I thought I would show you this picture. It's of my mother. It's rather old and very faded. My mum was two when this was taken. As you can see, it's a studio portrait and she's all dressed up in her Sunday best. The photo was taken while my mum was in the Hackney workhouse. This is the official photo that was shown to potential adoptive parents. You see, my mum was born in the workhouse. Her mother was single and she was put up for adoption at the age of two. It was quite a while ago and things are very different now. She didn't tell me until she was much older 
and it was a big reveal moment. My parents said they had something important to say. They took a deep breath. The announcement was made. I have to tell you, dear, I was adopted. My mum had put off telling me because she was embarrassed and ashamed, ashamed that she was different, illegitimate and unwanted. As I say, things are vastly different now. The culture when my mother was born meant that there was an enormous stigma to being single and pregnant, to being so poor and unsupported by family or the father, meaning that you can't do anything other than go to the workhouse. Just in case you're wondering, my parents had me late in life. I'm really not that old. So here we are continuing to follow the story of Abraham and Sarah. We heard how Abraham left his home and traveled to the land of Cana. He heard the promise of God telling him that he and Sarah, even though they were very old, would have a child. Abraham, man of faith, would be the father of a nation and all nations would be blessed through him. So far, so good. Now we arrive at today's reading. This is the more embarrassing part of the great patriarch's history. Something that, to be honest, I think I'd want to keep quiet about. It's full of rivalry, antagonism, resentment, bitterness and animosity, ending with making a mother and child homeless. I wonder if Abraham might have ended his tale with something like this. I loved Sarah and seeing her in so much pain and anguish broke my heart. I thought a baby by Hagar would ease her pain. Suddenly this tale of rivalry and enmity sounds like a love story. Does that make it more acceptable? The Bible does not leave out the unpleasant bits. It's life in all its rawness and life can be complicated. If we're not careful, we could look at these complicated family relationships with our 21st century eyes and draw conclusions based on how we live and who we are. In my case, white, female, middle class, four children and no slaves or servants. How things are here and now instead of considering the culture that existed in the days of Abraham. Was Sarah's reaction loving? Maybe not. But what was it that the culture of the time that she lived in framed how she was? This text is from the old Assyrian colony of Anatolia, which dates from around 1900 BC. A marriage contract stipulates that if the wife does not give birth in two years, she will purchase a slave woman for the husband. This family's dilemma and separate desperate sadness comes in the midst of the most amazing, life-changing, in fact, nation-forming promise from God. So much was invested into this band of nomadic desert dwellers. To Abraham and Sarah, the promise is Abraham would be a father of many nations, Sarah would be a mother of nations. After Ishmael is born, Hagar has the promise I will make a great nation from his descendants. Our two female characters dominate the action, lives intertwined, both so different and yet both becoming the bearers of the promise of God. Both the children born to Abraham become children of promise. Sarah was the wife, she had a position, it was one of status. Hagar was the slave, she also had a position, it was one of a slave. Sarah was a woman of wealth and considerable expectation. Hagar was a woman of no wealth and less expectation. Sarah was barren, causing her status to be in jeopardy. Hagar became pregnant, causing her status and in fact life and the life of her child to be in jeopardy. Sarah thinks the answer to her problem is to use Hagar's body. Her position allows this to happen. Hagar has no choice. Her position allows this to happen. Sarah saw Hagar daily becoming increasingly pregnant and she abuses her. Hagar saw the barren Sarah daily and she looked with contempt on her mistress. Sarah gets pregnant 
no longer needs Hagar and her feelings turn to hate. The presence of Hagar and her son are a constant reminder. Hagar's presence along with Ishmael are fodder for the hatred of Sarah, which festers and grows. Sarah had seen Hagar's elevated position as a threat, but now it's Ishmael who is a threat to Isaac. Is there something understandable about this reaction? Parents are fiercely protective when it comes to their children. Sending Hagar and Ishmael out is a pretty radical thing to do, but inheritance was important. It was not just the threat of the tangible that Ishmael could take away. It was the imagined threat to the object of love. Abraham loved both his sons. Genesis 17, 21 told us that God told Abraham, but my covenant will be confirmed in Isaac, who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. Ishmael would be blessed and become a great nation, but the covenant was with Isaac. Had Sarah moved from being distressed by the taunting of Hagar to jealousy of her? Was Sarah struggling with seeing the result of her lack of faith? Did she remember laughing when the visitors had come and said that she was about to become pregnant? Did she look at Hagar and think about having had sex with, a with Abraham? Was Ishmael a constant reminder of her past doubts? Was she hoping that if they were gone, it would be a case of out of sight, out of mind? We're not told what's going on in Sarah's heart and mind, but we do know the situation with Hagar was of Sarah's making. She thought she'd help God out in a way that was culturally acceptable. When things turned out badly, she doesn't take responsibility. Instead, she turns on Hagar and casts out the outcast. But God's original plan for Sarah's offspring to be the descendants of his chosen nation does not change. God remains faithful to all he had promised. And of course, Isaac was born on time, just when God had planned, just when God had said he would be. So here is Hagar, cast out into the desert, thirsty, hungry and feeling all the weight of responsibility of how to protect Ishmael. But Ishmael also has a promise over his life. It's hard to see those things, to hold on to them when overwhelmed by struggle. The promise of becoming a great nation was over the offspring of Abraham, over both of his sons. However, the promise of being a blessing to the nations was only over Isaac. From slave to concubine to mother of the master's child to outcast, it's all a bit of a turnaround. Sarah's pain was real and so is Hagar's. And God is there in the middle of all this, there for them both. In the midst of their pain and anguish, God sees them. Sarah learning how to live with memories of past ghosts and Hagar in the midst of the present anguish. Isaiah 49 says, never can a, mom, can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget you. See, I have written your name on the palm of my hands. A message to Israel, but repeated in one way or another through the Psalms, through the New Testament, as the heart of a loving God for his people, including us blessed through this Abrahamic covenant. Hagar believes the end is near and prepares for both her and Ishmael to perish when the angel of God, God calls to her. A promise of a great future is relayed and her eyes are open so she can see the water that's going to save her life, their lives. I wonder how many times we've been so blinded by our struggle we don't see the provision that God has put before us. Feeling forgotten, uh, forgotten and abandoned, God sees you. He says, I've not forgotten you. See, I have written your name on the palms of my hands. What's the culture of heaven? What's the way they do it around there? Why, it's the culture of love. 
After all, God is love. So it can't be anything but. If the culture of the kingdom of God is love and Jesus brought heaven to earth and we are citizens of that kingdom, then surely the culture where we are has to be love too. Do we have a culture of inclusivity for those with different social or ethnic backgrounds, sexual orientation, those who feel ashamed, cast out, socially ostracised, those like my mum, who if she had lived in the culture of today would no doubt have felt a lot less embarrassed by her birth, her meagre inheritance, her mother's shame, her father's absence. If God saved the life of Ishmael, the father of a nation and the father of Islam, then should I not believe he is looking after me? We all have moments of feeling we don't fit in and we need to know ourselves so that we can fully know and welcome others. Sometimes we are the needy, vulnerable stranger. Jean Stairs says this, once we acknowledge and welcome the stranger within ourselves, we will be more likely to develop an empathy for others who find themselves marginalised or confronting the reality of being an outsider. The more we embrace that exiled stranger within and beyond ourselves, the more intimately we become acquainted with God. My life is messy and I'm guessing our areas of yours may be too. I even see things in my life, some messy that resonate with this story. I see the picture of my lovely mum who lived her life with a dark cloud of shame within her. We need to know that even if a mother forgets her child, God will not forget us. If ever there are days when I feel like an outsider, I know that God who knit me together in my mother's womb sees me and knows me and has my name written on the palm of his hand. If culture's defined as the way we do things around here, then surely it's worth asking ourselves the question, what is the way we do things around here? What's the culture like around here? It has to be one of love and that's love for all because that's the culture of the kingdom of God and that's the kingdom we belong to. Let's be kingdom culture people. That's the way we do it around here. Somewhere where my mum would have felt she had a place and even her mum too. Living God, we want to lift all relationships before you today, asking that broken relationships within families, marriages, friendships, between communities and nations be healed. Living God, Father and Mother to us, unite, unite us in, in your, your love. love. Please help us avoid isolating ourselves from each other and from other people, creating a world where many feel lonely and are left alone. Living God, Father and Mother to us, unite, unite us in, in your love. love. Many families are fractured, live in disharmony and find it very difficult to forgive one another. Living God, Father and Mother to us, unite, unite us in, in your love. love. In marriages where promises and trust have been broken, pain has been inflicted, and where couples are wanting to choose to follow different paths. Living God, Father and Mother to us, unite, unite us, us in, in your love. love. In our world, where many treat each other with anger and contempt, corruption and abuse, oppression and torture, selfishness and greed. 
living God, Father and Mother to us, unite, unite us in, in your love. love. Lord, we come together to pray as one, that we may be as one, just as the Lord Jesus prayed that we, who are his body, may be one with himself, in the same way that you and he are united together in love and purpose. We hold hands in unity, you who have sustained countless generations, with the steadfastness of your love, with the strength of your wisdom. You are the blood that unites us. You are the pulse that revives us. You are where we begin, where we end, where we are now. We thank you, Lord, that even when we are not physically together, we can still join together in prayer. Let's join together now, as Jesus taught us, in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Lord of all the earth, we'll shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh.